Cool. Hi guys, my name is uh, Frank Wu with Red Hat, and uh, I think we'll just get started. So I'm a cloud specialist at Red Hat. What that means is if you are a Red Hat customer and you talk to your sales rep about containers, cloud, OpenStack, whatever, they bring in somebody like me to, to talk to you or one of my peers. So this talk I, I put together is really brief about to OpenStack or not, and I'll try to talk slowly because the non-native speakers earlier were like saying you should talk slowly, but I also live in New York City and I, have a, I tend to talk fast, so Oops, let me uh, go back. Oh, shoot. Oh, this is going great. Thanks, guys. Uh, let me, sorry. All right. So, let's fire this. So one of the reasons I asked customers, why do you guys want to go to OpenStack? Uh, a common reason, wait for this to load, is that they don't like their vendor. They want to have a, a vendor neutral platform, which OpenStack was often positioned as, right? And I think that's a fine reason. You know, maybe you have a disadvantageous financial relationship with the vendor, but change is hard, right? Um, technology is pretty easy to change, but people and process are very hard. In IT, it's no different, right? Your developers today probably has their Emacs, Vim set up very nicely. And on the operation side, people are used to their monitoring tools, their logging tools. The picture up on the left is actually Google's data center, which is color coded for some reason. I don't know what it means, but I figure the ops guys like it, right? So change is, is hard, right? Why do people really change, right? Bring about technology change. Usually it's a business initiative, right? I won't go into the details of this, but it's usually on the business side at the C level where they're saying, this is where we're going in the future, and the organization is investing in real technical effort as well as managerial effort. And it often involves external client initiatives. So before I talk about scenarios where I think OpenStack is a fit and OpenStack is not, um, I, I did want to put a disclaimer. I, I'm a Red Hat employee, right? So you know, today this is from an a individual working at Red Hat, and obviously my, my uh, viewpoints may be distorted. Why should you care about Red Hat's opinion? Red Hat is one of OpenStack's largest proponents, right? They spend a lot of money um, investing in the projects, hosting the summit, so on, but OpenStack is not all we do. Right, so OpenStack is not the only hammer I have to the solution when talking to the customers. There's other approaches, methodologies, um, things that you can do to leverage besides OpenStack. So this talk is really kind of to OpenStack or not from a, a slant of Red Hat's perspective, specifically an individual working at Red Hat. So first scenario I've run into when I talk to customers, you know, I have OpenStack expertise, right? You know, maybe one or two individuals came from PayPal or Comcast or Walmart. And, and this is a pretty easy one for me, right? You guys know what OpenStack is, you've operated a cluster, you've gone through the pains of managing a life cycle around OpenStack, right? This is, to me, in my mind, okay, this is, this is a good fit, right? This is a potential good fit. What about scenario two, where a customer goes to you and says, Frank, I, I want self-service VMs, right? Today, I, w I just want to present a user a catalog where they can click a button and have a virtual machine automatically provisioned. Today, it takes us six to eight weeks. It's a very manual process. We don't have any AWS usage yet, but you know, this is something we want to get ahead of the curve, right? And, and I think this is an interesting use case. Is OpenStack a fit or not? So oftentimes, the hypervisor is, is VMware, vCenter. So <clears throat> one approach that someone could take instead of putting around OpenStack is this idea of putting a self-service portal on top of your existing hypervisor, where an user could log into a catalog, click a button, and that, that calls vCenter to make API calls. You can actually integrate in an orchestrator, whether it's Puppet, Chef, Ansible, whatever, um, to do other integrations. In the case of Red Hat, we have a product called CloudForms, where someone could click a button within CloudForms to, to create a VM. CloudForms could call ServiceNow, go through your approval queue process, and then call vCenter, which creates uh, a VM. Um, CloudForms today could actually integrate into other parts of the infrastructure, as long as there's an API. But if your infrastructure provider does not have an API, you could technically write an Ansible playbook and then just run that Ansible playbook, right? In this case, the user has a self-service portal without ripping out their entire infrastructure and existing expertise. Um, you know, some keywords people are looking for is these are typically brownfield environments. They're not greenfield environments. And people are really looking for billing and chargeback around this. 
Um, keep in mind, CloudForms isn't the only product that does this, right? There's vRealize automation, but um, I think it's important for people to realize if they're trying to solve a problem, you don't just want to look at the latest buzzwords, but there's other approaches that you can do to solve end user problems. Some of the largest environments uh, taking this approach are excess of like 45,000 virtual machines, right? So it, the, the approach does scale. Sometimes I have this conversation with customers and they say, Frank, I think you hear me, but you're not really listening, right? Because everyone's polite in these conversations and <laughs> you know, after I explain this approach, they go, look, I, I'm, I'm really just trying to get away from my hypervisor vendor, right? That's, that's not what I told you in the beginning, but you know, cost is, is really a driving factor in this, right? You know, I, I believe, you know, the customer talking, that the hypervisor has slowly become commoditized, right? And there's a lot of higher uh, additional features that I don't need necessarily, right, that I'm being charged for. And really, we're trying to drive down our cost and get to a more efficient platform. And I think that's, that's great, right? Especially now that customers are telling me kind of their driving factors, it's cost. But if cost is, is a driving factor and a hypervisor is completely commoditized, according to you, one question I'd be interested in is, guys, wh why haven't you looked at Microsoft or Hyper-V, right? Most large enterprises have large agreements with Windows. Maybe not everybody has a ton of Microsoft Exchange servers lying around, but Hyper-V certainly should be under consideration. Um, similarly, Red Hat has a product um, that's KVM-based called Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization with similar functionality um, as HA, DRS, and so on, right? Again, this is an approach where you're solving your problems around cost, but you're not ripping out and changing the way you do networking or storage, right? I'm not saying this is the right or wrong answer, but it's something that you should consider. Scenario four. All right, Frank, this is, this is definitely OpenStack, right? We, we have a DevOps initiative. The CIO is saying that we have to get an idea um, from into production faster, right? From the code that the Java code a developer types in their IDE, I want to take that code and put it into production faster, right? And typically, you can't say the word DevOps uh, without saying Jenkins afterwards, right? That's what everyone likes to say. Um, but I I in my mind, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. There's this thing in Kubernetes in OpenShift where we have built in a lot of CI/CD integrations, right? Where we have something called source to image, where a developer can take their Java code and their IDE, push a git command, that code gets sucked into a, a Docker container image, and then runs a, a CI job within OpenShift and then gets pushed to production. Um, OpenShift actually ships with a containerized image of Jenkins, right? And everything is built in, right? So it's a very nice CI/CD workload. So is this an open stack opportunity? Well, maybe, but what if you already have an existing CI uh, environment outside of containers? You know, it doesn't have to be Jenkins, it could be Team City, Bamboo, whatever, and you can certainly integrate that into your SDLC process within OpenShift, but it's living outside of containers. What, what about if you have an existing um, repo for your artifacts? That's uh, Artifactory. OpenShift comes with a container registry, but some people like to use artifacts to store their container images. Gee, I wonder if there's a way I could automate and tie in parts of my infrastructure. In this case, I think it's a great fit for OpenStack, right? Because it's not just about virtual machines and containers, but it's about all these different environments and automating that process end to end, not just within that container orchestration system. Scenario six, we have a very hot project, right? Business is funding it. It's big data, it's blockchain, it's Hadoop, whatever. I'm taking this as an opportunity to transform my organization to use OpenStack. Um, there's certainly business value that OpenStack has in some of these applications like Hadoop. If you think about the idea of agility, right? Where if Hadoop is running in virtualized machines, there's this concept of rapid prototyping where somebody can spin up clusters quickly and spin them back down, right? There's certainly value on that. But before jumping in, um, I think the two questions people need to ask is one, what is the minimum viable product or MVP that the business is trying to prove by testing these emerging technologies? And what is the timeline that you have on proving this out? In this case, OpenStack may be a fit for you, but you may be wanting to look at managed OpenStack services, right? Or again, if there's value in that agility. Scenario seven, strategic hosting. Um, these are large providers where hosting is really viewed as a uh, as a strategic competency of the organization. They may have large steady state workloads where the pure cost economics is, OpenStack is far superior to public cloud, but they also want um, control and governance, right? There's certainly more flavors today in the public cloud around CPU intensive workloads, memory intensive workloads, but there's nothing like having your own platform that you can control and optimize for your applications on. Scenario eight, and this is the last scenario is, <laughs> 
you know, everyone is bought in, guys. You know, uh, the networking team has been sold on Cisco ACI. They're moving to SDN. Storage, you know, we're bought into this idea of block storage. How even our virtualization teams, the Windows guys and Linux guys, are in agreement, right? We're moving to this new hypervisor. Red Hat, please come inside. Let's do a POC. Let's stand up OpenStack, right? Let's do some upgrades and show management that we can operate this. Here, I think OpenStack is certainly a, a fit, but. My only caveat I would say is you want to be wary not to have a zombie cloud where you're staying up OpenStack, right? So in these scenarios, I think it's important to dig into the use cases and go back to the lines of business in terms of, guys, what are we actually going to be deploying? Because the success metric of the project shouldn't be whether or not you stood up OpenStack. It should be about what type of workloads that we get on there. And you know, in the DevOps use case, right, we shorten our software release cycles from two months to two weeks. There's real value there that you can tell an SVP versus, hey, I stood up a, a Linux cluster. So I, I know I've been talking fast. So uh, hopefully you guys, you guys found this talk helpful. I think the, the takeaway is technology choice is not jeopardy, right? It's not like Buzz, what is Ansible? I'm, I'm going to automate my VMware infrastructure. What, what is OpenStack? At the end of the day, we're just trying to make the best choice with the limited amount of information we have at a given point in time. Um, but I hope that you guys found this talk helpful in seeing where OpenStack could solve some problems and, and where other tools may also help solve some problems besides just throwing out a bunch of buzzwords. So thank you.